Welcome to the United States Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute, JGI. The JGI was created in 1997 by the United States Department of Energy to unite the genomics and engineering expertise pioneered at three separate Department of Energy national laboratories. In 1999, the production genomics facility was opened here in Walnut Creek, California, in a partnership between the Department of Energy and the University of California. JGI's first assignment was to work on the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome was finally completed in 2003. JGI then refocused its efforts to use genomics to provide solutions in the areas of bioenergy, carbon cycling, and bioremediation. JGI is also actively engaged in education. Hi, my name is Miranda Harmon-Smith. Today we will show you how we sequence DNA here at the JGI's production genomics facility. Let's start with a basic overview of how we sequence DNA. Our ultimate goal is to sequence all the DNA of a particular organism, or its genome. Let's imagine the cell nucleus as a train station. Inside our train station is the genome represented by long lines of train cars. The cars are the nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Our job is to make a map of which cars are in what order. The first thing we do is to break the long train into smaller pieces this way, we can split the job up and work on sequencing all the smaller pieces at the same time, instead of trying to count millions of cars one at a time in order. It is faster to have more people working in parallel. There are two parts to sequencing DNA. The first is to identify each nucleotide. The second is to determine the order of each nucleotide in the train. We solve the identity problem by making special cars that fit the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine positions, called DDNTPs. These DDNTPs fluoresce, or light up when excited by a laser. This way we can identify the nucleotides indirectly, without having to actually see the molecules. Imagine each DDNTP as a caboose that attaches to the end of a line of cars with a big colored lantern. Each fluorescent nucleotide replacement lights up with a different color, so that we can tell the identity of each. In order to tell the order of nucleotides, we make multiple copies of the line of cars. We start at one end and put a lit caboose in the place of the first car. Then we copy it again with a regular car in the first position, and a caboose in the second spot, and so on down the line. After a while, we end up with thousands of copies of portions of the train, each copy being one nucleotide longer than the previous copy. Because we only copy the train from one direction, the cars are all in the same order. They are just of different lengths. As you can see, if we line up the shortest train to the longest, we can read the last car of each train and see the identity and order of each nucleotide. That should give you a basic overview of what we do. Let's go into the lab and follow an actual DNA sample through the sequencing process. Let's quickly review the DNA sequencing process. First, collect the DNA, break the DNA down into smaller, more manageable pieces, make many copies of those smaller pieces, read the pieces, and then reassemble the pieces into the larger genome. You have already done the first step in the process in collecting and isolating the DNA. Here at the JGI, we randomly break the DNA down into those smaller, manageable size pieces. We use this device called the HydraShear to break the DNA down into fragments of three kilobases or 3,000 base pairs. With current technology, we can sequence about 700 bases at a time. The DNA sample is loaded into a syringe that pushes it back and forth through the hydroshear. The hydroshear pushes fluid containing the long strands of DNA from one end through the ruby aperture to a reservoir. As the fluid approaches the aperture, it accelerates to maintain a volumetric flow rate through the smaller area of contraction, like when you put your thumb over the end of a garden hose. As part of the DNA gets forced through the hole with the fluid, the drag forces of the fast-moving liquid in the aperture pull the end of the long strand of DNA and stretches the DNA until the end snaps off. With constant pressure, pieces of DNA of consistent size are pulled from the longer strand. The hydroshear does a good job of breaking the DNA into random 3 kb fragments, but they have ragged ends or single-strand overhangs. These need to be repaired using enzymes before we can continue. 
We need the ends to be blunt-ended so that they can be inserted or ligated into our blunt-ended vector later in the process. We are only looking for fragments that are three kilobases long. The hydroshear creates a tight size distribution. However, there are still fragments that are too long or too short floating around in our sample. The sheared fragments are loaded into a well on an agarose gel. By way of electrophoresis, the different size fragments will separate based on their molecular weight. Once the fragments have separated, a technician using a molecular weight marker as a guide extracts the section of the gel containing the 3 kb fragments. The fragments are then purified from the gel. This microcentrifuge tube contains all of the three kilobase strands of DNA. We have to separate each of the DNA fragments from one another. We get nature to help us out a bit. We use plasmids as our DNA fragment sorting and copying machines. Plasmids are little rings of self-replicating DNA, naturally found in bacteria. The plasmid we use is PUC18. This plasmid was engineered with two very specific and important traits that it passes on to its host bacteria. The first is the LAC-Z gene, whose product will turn the bacterial colony blue in the presence of X-Gal, a lactose sugar analog. The second is that the plasmid makes the bacterium resistant to the antibiotic ampicillin. We will be using these traits to sort the plasmids later on. Here you can see the PUC18 plasmid represented by the ring. Through the action of a blunt-ended cutting enzyme, the plasmid DNA is broken in the middle of the LAC-Z gene. The plasmid is now primed to accept the DNA fragments that have been sheared, blunt-ended, and size-selected. The digested plasmids, now known as vectors, are mixed with the fragments and, using an enzyme, are allowed to combine. Here we have our ligation, containing our vectors, with insert ligated as well as vector and insert that didn't ligate. This cuvette contains a mix of plasmids in a solution with E. coli bacteria. Plasmids can get into bacteria on their own. However, we want this process to happen quickly. We want an even distribution of one plasmid containing one DNA fragment per bacterium. To do this, we put the bacteria and plasmid solution in an electroporator. This machine does what it sounds like. It uses an electric shock to blast tiny pores in the cell wall of the bacteria for the plasmids to enter. These holes are then quickly repaired by the bacteria's natural healing mechanisms. When the bacterium takes in the foreign DNA of the plasmid, it is said to have been transformed, and the process is called transformation. The transformed E. coli are added to media and then placed at their favorite temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, to recover. Electroporation yields about one in a thousand transformed cells that have incorporated a single plasmid. Here is our sample of E. coli bacteria. We've allowed the bacteria time to recover from their shock treatment in the electroporator. Now we're going to take this sample to the plating process, where we will identify which bacteria incorporated the plasmid with our DNA insert. Remember, only one in a thousand bacteria incorporate the plasmid with our DNA insert. The transformation stock of E. coli is diluted and spread evenly onto large 9x9 auger plates with the help of glass beads. The medium on the plate contains ampicillin, an antibiotic, and X-Gal, a lactose analog. Remember, the plasmid had two genes built into it. One was ampicillin resistance, and the other was a blue color change in the presence of X-Gal. Some vectors accept the fragments, some don't. If the plasmid accepts a sheared segment of DNA, the LAC-Z gene becomes ineffective, and the bacterial colonies remain white. If the plasmid does not accept a fragment, the LAC-Z gene remains functional and the colonies turn blue. We plate the bacteria that have been exposed to our plasmid on plates containing X-Gal and ampicillin. The use of ampicillin kills any bacterium that does not have a plasmid in it. This means that all of the white colonies on the plates will represent bacteria that have plasmids containing our fragments. Once the E. coli has time to grow, we will know which bacterial colonies have cloned fragments of your genome in them. For the first time, we will be able to see which colonies have the genome plasmids because the colonies will be white. Let's let these incubate for 18 to 20 hours at 37 degrees Celsius.